Casting Crown song from 2018 called Only Jesus. And here's the way the, uh, the lyrics go. It says, make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers, but all an empty world can sell is empty dreams. I got lost in the light when it was up to me to make a name the world remembers, but Jesus is the only name to remember. And I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. And that's the chorus. I've only got one life to live. I'll let every second point to him, only Jesus. All the kingdoms built, all the trophies won, will crumble into dust when it's said and done, because all that really mattered, did I live the truth to the ones I love, was my life the proof that there is only one whose name will last forever, and I don't, I don't want to leave a legacy, I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. I love that, don't you? Because at the end of the day, there's only one name, that people are going to know and remember, and that's the name of Jesus. And um, when you and I can point other people to Christ, that's the kind of thing that will last beyond our lifetime. Um, Benjamin Franklin said it this way, If you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead, either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. <laughs> Maybe he's right. But uh, when you think about how we live our lives, if we live our lives for Jesus Christ, I can't think of a better way to live. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Moses lived that kind of life. Uh, look, if you will, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, and we're getting to the end of Moses' story. And in Deuteronomy 31, just the first couple of verses say, Then Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel, saying, I am now 120 years old. I can no longer act as your leader. The Lord has told me you will not cross the Jordan. And we'll stop right there because he goes into a long speech and stuff. But right there, we know that Moses knows that his time as a leader has come to an end. He's 120 years old. He knows that he's not going to cross the Jordan. And uh, he's now wanting to prepare the people for his departure. I want you to consider Moses' legacy. When I think of Moses' legacy, I think of two things. I think of loving God and, and leading uh, others. Uh, let's talk about each one. Loving God was, I think, his first and foremost legacy there in Exodus, we got to go back to Exodus for a moment, but in Exodus 33, verse 7, Now Moses took a tent, and he pitched it outside the camp, at a distance from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting, and anyone who wanted to consult the Lord would go to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up, each one at the door of his tent, and they would watch Moses until he entered the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance to the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. As all the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up, then bow and worship each one at the door of his tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, and his assistant, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent, which to me gives us a little clue, a little foreshadowing there of probably why Moses picked Joshua to be his successor. It's because Joshua kind of lingered where God and Moses met. And I think that says a lot about Joshua. But uh, Moses loved God. And out of his relationship with God, he met with God, talked face to face, had a friendship with God, uh, that kind of a relationship, that out of that walk with God, uh, a couple of things really jump out to me about his legacy. One is his communion with the Lord. Um, he seemed to be pursuing a deeper walk with the Lord. In Exodus 33, verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, Look, 
You've told me, lead this people up, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name, and you've also found favor with me. Now, if indeed uh, I've found favor with you, please teach me your ways, and I will know you, so that I may find favor with you. Now consider that this nation is your people. And he, and he replied, or the Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses responded, If your presence does not go, don't make us go up from here. How will it be known that I and your people have found favor with you unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord answered Moses, I will do this very thing you've asked, for you have found favor with me. And I know you by name. And then Moses said, please let me see your glory. And I love that because this is an exchange between God and Moses. And Moses is wanting to follow the Lord's leadership. And he secures God's presence in his life and God's favor on his life. But then he goes, I want to see your glory. Okay, He's ever pursuing that deeper relationship with God. And so the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Uh, but he added, you cannot see my face, for humans cannot see me and live. And the Lord said, here's a place near. You're stand on the rock, and when my glory passes by, I'll put you in the, in the cleft or crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And then I'll take my hand away, and you'll see my back, but not my face. And so... Moses gets to see the glory of God, okay? And uh, so one way we know that Moses loved God was the communion that he had with the Lord, uh, how he regularly sought the Lord and he enjoyed uh, sweet fellowship with the Lord and had a close walk with the Lord. And out of that communion came his, in my opinion, greatest contribution uh, when, whenever you talk about Moses in the Bible, what's the first thing you think of? Anybody? They, they made a movie about it. Ten Commandments. That's right. Ten Commandments. Um, the Ten Commandments, that, that's his greatest contribution. Uh, I want to read a little bit of scripture about that, and then I will add a second thought to that that we hardly ever think about, but it's equally true. In Exodus 34, it says, As Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands as he descended the mountain, he did not realize that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. And when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. And afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he commanded them to do everything the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. Now, what all did God tell him? Well, you've got the Ten Commandments, and then later on there were more laws that were, that were given that kind of expound on specific things. It, you, can, you can read it in Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and all that. Uh, but the other thing that you rarely hear people talk about that to me is as equally important as the Ten Commandments is the tabernacle, which became the temple. And remember the difference between the tabernacle and the temple? The tabernacle was portable. It was a tent. And the temple is permanent. It was an actual structure that didn't move. And the blueprint for both was the same, right? You had the Holy of Holies. You had the... The, the altars, and you had all, all the details. Everything was exquisitely expressed as to what was the dimensions of the temple, um, the rooms of the temple, how they were to be decorated. Everything all the way down to the tiniest detail was mentioned. In Exodus 39, beginning in verse 32, it says, So all the work for the tabernacle, because if you're reading the chapters prior to Exodus, Exodus 39, it goes into great detail about all the different parts and pieces of the tabernacle. And so in Exodus 39, kind of summarizing it, it says, All the work for the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was finished, and the Israelites did everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
They brought the tabernacle to Moses. Remember, it's portable. So they they brought it to him, and I'm sure they just kind of laid it out. Here it is. Here's this. Here's that. Here's all the parts and pieces. Kind of like when you buy something in a box and you got to assemble it, right? And uh, it says here, they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent with all its furnishings, its clasp, its supports, crossbars, and it just goes on and on and on. And then you go on down to verse 42. The Israelites had done all the work according to everything the Lord had commanded Moses. And Moses inspected all the work they had accomplished. They had done just as the Lord commanded, and then Moses blessed them. Now, let's give you a quick New Testament perspective. When you go to the New Testament and you read the book of Hebrews, you will find out that the temple on earth is a replica of the temple in heaven. Okay? And so... um, God told Moses, here's how big the temple will be. Here are the dimensions. Here are the rooms. Here's what it's going to look like, all the way down to the last detail. And how could he do that? Because the earthly tabernacle temple is a replica of the real temple in heaven. Uh, Remember, Hebrews stresses that Jesus is our high priest and that he himself was our sacrifice, and he ended, he entered the temple in heaven, and once for all for all time, he he provided eternal redemption for those who believe in him. And so, uh, when you look at the big picture here, Moses, part of his legacy was he loved God, and, and out of his love for God, we see two things: we see his communion with God, how he had a close walk with the Lord, and also the contribution that came out of that which was, of all people, God used Moses because of his communion with God, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine? I really can't. And he's up on the mountaintop with God. He receives the Ten Commandments, and he receives, if you will, the blueprint of what will become the tabernacle and eventually the temple. Those two things are the greatest contributions I see uh, in Moses' life. And they flew, they, or they flow out of his love for God and his relationship with God. All right, there's a second thing I want you to think about when it comes to Moses' legacy. The first thing is loving God, right? He had a communion with God, and he made a contribution by giving us the law and the blueprint to the tabernacle. But the second part of his legacy is how he led others, okay? Because he loved God, he led other people, you know, towards God. Uh, there was a, uh, a moment in, in Moses' life where he had to learn this lesson. And I think we all have to at times. It's found in Exodus 18. Moses was a grown man. He was married at this point. And his father-in-law Jethro came. Uh, the story is in Exodus 18, beginning in verse 13. It says, the next day Moses sat down to judge the people, and they stood around Moses from morning until evening. Get that in your mind for a moment. Back at that point in time, everybody went to Moses if they needed anything. Moses was the closest one to God. He was the lawgiver. He expounded on all these laws. Uh, He knew the blueprint to the tabernacle. Um, I mean... You just went to Moses to get things done. And a lot of people wanted to get things done, so a lot of people wanted to see Moses. So everybody got in line and took a number. And he dealt with people all day long, from morning until evening. It says, when Moses' father-in-law saw everything he was doing for them, he asked a question. He says, what is this thing you're doing for the people? Why are you alone sitting as judge while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses replied to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me. And I make a decision between one man and another. And I teach them God's statutes and laws. And Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you're doing is not good. Now, sometimes you might go, well, why didn't somebody else say something? It's Moses. So the father-in-law said it to him. What you're doing is not good. He says, 
you will certainly wear out both yourself and these people who are with you because the task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. And the implication is you shouldn't do it alone. Now listen to me, he said. I'll give you some advice and God be with you. You be the one to represent the people before God and bring their cases to him. He's not changing his role. He's not changing his work. But then he says this, instruct them about the statutes and the laws and teach them the way to live and what they must do. But you should select from all the people able men, God-fearing, trustworthy, and hating dishonest prophet, and place them over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They should judge the people at all times. And then they can bring you every major case, but judge every minor case themselves. In this way, you will lighten your load, and they will bear it with you. And if you do this, and God so directs you, you'll be able to endure, and also all these people will be able to go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. So Moses chose able men from all Israel, and made them leaders over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. They would bring the hard cases to Moses, but they would judge every minor case themselves. I'd say that's wise, right? Moses was treating every problem like it was a big problem. And his father-in-law had enough wisdom to say, Look, uh, find people that you can trust that deal with the minor issues, and you deal with the major issues, and that was wise. I believe Moses learned to delegate at this point in his life, but he continued to grow as a leader when he began to groom his successor and develop another leader. There in Deuteronomy 31, where we started a few moments ago, Moses said, I'm 120 years old. I can no longer act as your leader. The Lord has told me, you will not cross the Jordan. Verse 3, the Lord your God is the one who will cross ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will drive them out. Joshua is the one who will cross ahead of you, as the Lord has said. The Lord will deal with them as he did with Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will deliver them over to you, and you must do to them exactly as I've commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them, for the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Moses then summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you will go with this people into the land the Lord swore to give to their fathers. You will enable them to take possession of it. The Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. And so here uh, Moses had prayed to God. The Lord revealed to him, your successor is going to be Joshua. And Moses began to prepare him to take hold of the leadership mantle. And so when you look at the legacy of Moses, he loved God, and you can tell because he had a close communion with God, and out of that close communion, he became the lawgiver and the architect of the blueprint of the tabernacle. Not only did he love God, but he led others. He led by delegating responsibilities and ultimately developing a a leader to succeed him in the work that God had given him to do in Israel. It reminds me of a quote from Eric Geiger. Eric Geiger said, A leader who is not developing future leaders is not serving the organization well. The leader is either being short-sighted or selfish. Short-sighted in that the future is not being considered or selfish in that the leader thinks only about himself. How true that can be. So tonight, as I kind of bring this home, I want to raise the issue, how can you and I leave a godly legacy? 
We've talked about Moses' legacy, but what about our legacy? How can you and I leave a godly legacy? Well, if we go back and look at what we just looked at, I think we can walk away with three practical things you and I can do to leave a godly legacy. Number one, deepen your relationship with God. I think it has to start there. As Christians, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. We wear His name. We're a child of the King. We're a child of God. And the life we live is no longer our own. It's His. And so we want to deepen our relationship with God. Everything should flow from that. You know, there are certain people in life you can recognize their voice. I know in a previous church, I had a guy come up to me one time, Sandy, and he said, I saw you in Walmart the other day. And I said, you did? He said, yeah, I was three hours over and I heard the laugh and I knew that's you, you know. Uh, Sandy walked in the office in the morning and I heard a voice and I said, that's Sandy, right? And so voice recognition, when you recognize a voice, you can be in a crowd. Moms, how many of you have been in a crowd and all of a sudden your kid cries or hollers and there might be all kinds of noise going on, but you hear it, you, you detect it, you pinpoint it. In the same way that you and I can recognize a voice in the crowd, we need to be able to recognize God's voice when He speaks. And the best way we can recognize God's voice is spend time with Him. Read His Word. If you want to hear from God, read the Scripture. The Bible is His Word. It's, it's breathed out by God. It's profitable. And the more time we spend in Scripture, the easier it is to hear God's voice and get in tune with Him. So deepen your relationship with God. Spend time with Him in prayer. You know, make an appointment every day. Read His Word. Don't just read it, but reflect on it and uh, respond to it in faith and prayer and obedience. And when you and I do that, we will deepen our relationship with God. A second thing we can do to leave a godly legacy is to delegate responsibility to others. Remember what we were reading a while ago in Exodus 18. You know, it took Moses' own father-in-law to watch him one day and say, hey, what you're doing is not good. And then his recommendation was, you still need to do what you're doing, but find trusted people to handle the minor issues and you tackle the major issues. And that's wise because there's only so many hours in a day and we have to be good stewards of our time. Delegate responsible responsibility to others. Um, I no longer have kids now. I have teenagers. Two of them. One's 17 and one going on 20. You'll get that in a minute. And, um, and you know, now they can do things they used to not do, right? You know, a few, a few years ago, they couldn't wait for dad or mom to get done cooking because they were ready to eat. Now they want to help cook. That's good. That's great. That's what you've got to do. Uh, look at what your kids can do now compared to a couple of years ago and, and delegate responsibility. That's how you raise them up. That's how you get them ready for adulthood. John Maxwell said this. He said the key to effective leadership is to, de to delegate to others who are gifted in the areas that you are particularly not good at. And that way, you free yourself up to focus on the areas of your God-given strengths and where you're most productive. And you know what? I have found that to be true. So you and I need to delegate responsibility to others. That's one way that we can leave a godly legacy. And then the third thing that I would say on how to leave a godly legacy, deepen your relationship with God, to delegate responsibility to others, and develop leaders around you. If you go back and look at what we covered a moment ago, at some point in his leadership journey, at some point in his walk with God, Moses knew that, you know, his time was coming to an end. He knew he wouldn't cross the Jordan River, and he prayed about the future of his people, uh, Israel. 
And the Lord revealed to him, Joshua is going to be your successor. And so he began to develop a leader around him. There's an old uh, story. Do you recall the epitaph on the tombstone of a business executive? It reads like this. This cemetery is full of people who thought they were indispensable. This cemetery is full of people who thought they were indispensable. Many times I think you and I feel like we're indispensable. Well, I'm the only one that can do this. You'd be surprised. Uh, You'd be surprised. Uh, You know, you and I need to realize we all have a shelf life. And we've got to do the, the, the best we can with what God has given us while we can. Uh, another, another quote from John Maxwell that I like, most leaders have followers around them. They believe the key to leadership is gaining more followers. Few leaders surround themselves with other leaders. The ones who do bring great value to their organizations, and not only is their burden lightened, but their vision is carried on and enlarged. As Peter Drucker said, there's no success without a successor. And you know what? I found that to be true too. Moses was able to groom his successor. And God's people went forward in their faith with God. They went forward into the future that God had planned for them. They had the law. They had the tabernacle. They had the legacy of Moses. They had the leadership of Joshua, his successor. And they had their faith in God. And they continued to move forward. Okay? Success, in my opinion, is not what you did when you could. It's what you leave behind. And that's why there's no success without a successor. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Let's take a moment to contrast Moses as a leader with Joshua as a leader. At, at a first glance, you look at them and go, they're both men of God, and they are. And they're both men that love the Lord, and they're both men that did a lot of great things uh, when God worked in their life and through their life. But let me tell you what the difference was in their leadership. Moses, he had the legacy of loving God and leading others, and when it was all said and done, people had the law, they had the tabernacle, and they had a leader to lead them forward into the future. Then Joshua, being that leader that led them forward into the future, helped them claim their inheritance into the promised land. And you would go, well, that's quite an accomplishment. But in Judges chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, here would be the, the summary of Joshua's leadership, even though he was a great servant of the Lord. It says in Judges 2, verse 8, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. He was a servant of the Lord. He died at the age of 110. Remember Moses made it to 120. He made it to 110. It says they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in the hill country of Ephraim. And then verse 10, that whole generation, okay, his generation, was also gathered to their ancestors. And then another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. So Joshua led his generation, but he lost the next generation. And when Joshua died and all his contemporaries died, there existed a new generation in the country that didn't know the Lord and didn't know the works he had done. That's hard to fathom, isn't it? We look at the culture of our country today, and you look at the last 50 years or so, and you can go, wow, we got from there to here so fast. Well, it's happened before, right here in the Old Testament. And in one generation, really, I guess, a couple of generations, from Moses' generation, Joshua's generation, and then boom, the third generation didn't know the Lord. It's hard to imagine, but it happens. And I like what Eric Geiger said when he compares Moses and Joshua. He says, there's no record of Joshua investing in anyone. We don't see him intentionally developing leaders. We don't read of him pouring into others. And the generation after his leadership didn't know the Lord. 
Think about this question. If you were to hand your temporary leadership assignments over today, would a statement about your leadership sound more like Moses or more like Joshua? Moses was intentionally investing his life in Joshua. Under Joshua's leadership, Israel enjoyed prosperity and victory, but Joshua failed to see the value of investing in other leaders. Will you be like Moses or like Joshua? Will you invest in others who will ensure the following generations know the Lord and His works? I don't know about you, but it challenges me when I look at the legacy of Moses, who was a man of God. He loved God. He had that close walk. And out of that came the contribution of the law and the tabernacle. And he led other people. He learned to delegate responsibility and authority. And he also developed leaders that could lead others. And that was his greatest legacy. And it's something I think that you and I would do well to be wise and do the same. And so tonight, I want to close with just a simple question. Considering it, consider it the challenge from this particular lesson tonight from the Word. And that is this, what will be your legacy? What will people say about you when your time is done? I don't know about you, but I look at the lesson from Moses and I can say right now, I hope they can talk about my walk with God. I hope they can talk about how God used me to serve others, lead others, and teach others. Someone shared a story once about the late, great John Wooden that was the wizard from Westwood that led UCLA years ago to all those national championships. And someone asked him, they said, you know, what do you want your legacy to be? He thought for a minute, he said, well, I hope it's not all the championships. And he got everybody's attention and he thought a little bit and he answered them and he says, I hope they'll remember me for my kindness and how I treated other people. And I went, Wow. In other words, he knows that at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, beyond our accomplishments and achievements, it's our character that counts. It's who we are that gives life to all the things we do. And so I would encourage you tonight to ask yourself, what will be your legacy? Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this word from the word. And Father, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, help us to pursue a deeper walk with you. And Lord, help us to look around at those that are near and dear to us and help us, Lord, to learn how to delegate things so that they can grow up and be the people you've called them to be. And Lord, spiritually, help us to become that uh, spiritual dad or mom, that, that parent that reproduces a disciple by sharing the Word of God and sharing our lives with other people so that we can develop leaders for the next generation so that they can know you and know your works and they can go out and share it with the next generation after them. Father, I pray for your will to be done in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Before I let you go tonight, um, if it's all right with you, Gordon, normally we would have a business, a business meeting because it's the first Wednesday after the first Sunday.